go. Annalie, welcome to the My Mate podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> cool. Are you, where are you <laughs> to Melbourne are you right now? Uh, Heatherton, so around the Cheltenham, Moorabbin area. Oh, cool. We're not far away at all. I'm just down in Chelsea Heights. So we're like 25 minutes away or 20 minutes, even less. You might even be in my bubble. Could it be true? We could have been, we could have done this in person. <laughs> this could have been a big <laughs> outdoor show. <laughs> a, for it the first time in I don't know, nine months or something. Oh, I know. It's it's been it's been very, very bizarre. I just started reading a book, um, to, to put it right now. I started reading a book um about uh, an, an Auschwitz survivor, so all about the Holocaust and all that. It was pretty hectic, but um there were moments through, throughout the lockdown where I was like, man, I'm really starting to struggle here. I'm starting to feel very existential and lost. And then you pick up a book <laughs> like that and you're like, it's, it's not too bad. <laughs> it wasn't the tattooist of Auschwitz, was it? No, I, that's on the reading list. It's, it's okay. called The Choice. It's called The Choice. Um, okay. It's okay. amazing. It's amazing. Like you read it and you're just like, it feels like I'm reading a fiction novel, you know, but it's, it's all yes. legit. I can't get over that. Yes. Yes. And I, the reason I ask is because I've just finished the, the Tattooist of Auschwitz mm -hmm. and I was thinking the exact same thing, you know, everyone's complaining and it's really hard for a lot of people. It's mental health month, week, month, yeah. <laughs> mental health month yes. and week um, this month in October. And so, you know, people are really doing it tough and reading that book or, or any of those kinds of books where there's real situations where people are bombed, people have lost their homes, they've lost their livelihood, their food, shut, like everything has been disrupted majorly. It really puts perspective on the current situation. And I, I, I finished that book and I thought, Do you know what? I reckon this is required reading for people in Melbourne right now, you know, just to give people a bit of a boost that says, a, like, let's get clear on history and make sure we're not making the same mistakes. And B, it's not so bad. It's not so bad to wear a mask. It's not so bad to only go 5Ks. You know what? You've got access to food and water and shelter, hopefully. And so it's not so bad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the things as well is there's also, a, we, we're living in a funny time where um, there's almost kind of like this, toxic positivity going on. It's like think happy thoughts. And yes. Like I love that to an extent, you know, you also want to like you and I both agree we're going to start this conversation in a very authentic manner, which is the way all conversations mm. should start really, you know? So I think mm. there's an element where let, let's be grateful for what we have. Absolutely. But if you are struggling, it's mental health month, it's mental health week. There are tools out there and we've, we've got to get to the truth of how we're feeling, you know, because pain is, yeah. is relative. It's one of the things I really liked about reading this, this author, um, Edith Eager, is because she, she goes on and on about this relativity, rel relativity of pain idea and, and the fact that mm. so many people would come to her because she's a psychotherapist and uh, she's 93 now. She still works. It's incredible. Um, wow. So many people would come to her and they would say, I can't, I feel so bad for saying that, you know, I lost my job or this, you've been to Auschwitz. How could I ever... And, and it was this mm. really interesting kind of dichotomy of opinions going on. It was, yeah, it's very fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think this idea of positivity, like you say, you know, positive thinking has such a bad rap because if I think people misconstrue the idea of positive thinking, you know, it's one thing to be grateful and have gratitude and we can call that positive thinking because, you know, we're looking on the bright side or we're being more positive, but if we are blanketly if that's the word, <laughs> yes, yes. being more positive by denying how we actually feel, then that, that is toxic positivity. And it's just false, pure and simple. It's just false. And yeah. you know, that's not going to make you feel better. It's in fact, just going to make you feel worse because your body going incongruent. Nah, you're not even buying this. No oh, one's fine, buying fine. this. Just give me another coffee. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Hey, um, I, I, I read your book. It was awesome. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, are you doing, are you doing an audio version? Have you done an audio version? I haven't. And you're the second person to ask. Maybe I should, but to be honest, I, 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 it's a, you know, you've read it. It's a pocketbook. It's supposed to be a quick read to get some, yeah. you know, insights and access to some quick concepts and get the conversations going. I just didn't know people would want an audio book on a little book, but I don't know. I'm happy to do it. 
<laughs> the, the only reason I ask is um, I, I was really unsure for a long time, but then I would also look at the way I kind of acted and I would listen to a lot of books. I'm like, oh, okay, just might be into mm-hmm. another market to get, get your information into people's yes. heads whilst they're um, doing the dishes or going for a run or whatever it is. So, Yes. Well, actually, when I think about it, my husband doesn't do a lot of reading. Well, he does do a lot of reading, but not physical book reading. He just just can't do the physical book reading, but he's pretty good at the Audi, Audible. Yeah. He's pretty good at Audible books. So yes, yes. I think there's something to that considering my market is men, even though he's a, he's a sample size of one, yeah. <laughs> but well, there it is. Yeah, absolutely. How did you find the writing process? Um, because it's, it, it, the way the book, the, the, the pocketbook, as you say, is, is, is kind of set mm-hmm. out. It's, it's very factual. There's a lot of evidence-based work. It, it, when I was reading it, it felt like, it was just this this stuff that you really wanted to get out onto, onto the page, but you, because you were doing so much, you never really had the time. So it's like, bang, here's the pocketbook that's finally done. <laughs> well, and there it is, folks. That's exactly how it happened. So, <laughs> so the book, um, when men lead women. Well, funnily enough, it, I never intended it to be a book. So, so here's the thing, Tom. Here's the thing. I'm actually about eighty percent of the way through my other book, you know, the real book, the big book, you know, like a book book. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. I'm currently writing a book right now called The Gender Penalty. So this is based on the stereotype penalties that women face, you know, playing in a man's world or for want of a better metaphor. And because, you know, I run women at work programs and I do a lot of work in that space. And so, of course, it's the obvious thing is to capture all those years of stories and insights and um, strategies and put it together in a book. Mm. But because I run this program also, not just a public one, but also as an in-house corporate program, which means, you know, we run the masterclass and we do ongoing coaching and I involve the executive team and the managers of the women I was having conversations with the managers of the women who a lot of the time happen to be men Mm -hmm. and the executive teams who a lot of the time are mostly men. And in the privacy of those forums and sometimes then in the corridor, you know, via some private conversations or in one-on-one coaching, I would get questions like those that I covered in the book, you know, almost like secret questions that, I don't feel comfortable enough to put on the table in front of, you know, the whole business or, 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 um, perhaps even the women in the program, because I feel like I should, a, I should know the answer B if I'm asking this question, am I just showing the fact that I'm not supportive or I'm a sexist or I don't really know what's going on. Mm. Um, but if I don't ask these questions, then how can I ever get through the questions in my mind? Things Mm -hmm. like, is it really, is it really, uneven. Like it looks on the surface, like it's not, you know, those sorts of things. So Mm. I was writing the big book, delivering these programs, having all these side conversations. And I thought, cause I like to write mini books while I'm writing a big book. I went, (laughs) all right, well, let me just take a pause for a moment. And I'll just, as you say, I'll just whip up. (laughs) Can I just say, if you've ever, if anyone's ever written a book, who's watching or reading this or listening to this reading, (laughs) listening to this, you know, there's no such thing as whipping up a book, right? So I'm just going to whip up this, this pocketbook. And what happened was I started writing a white paper, like an essay and it became, and I just, I, cause I just wanted to capture these ideas. As you say, I, I mm. felt a sense of urgency around it because I just kept, kept having the same conversations. And I thought, how do I get the answers to, to more men? So it doesn't have to be one-on-one conversations with me. What can I socialize by way of helping people move through these questions and concerns and fears? And so I thought, great, I'll write a paper on it. And then the paper became so large and unwieldy that I thought no one's going to read this really long paper, (laughs) but they might read a really short book. Perfect. Bravo. And so the pocketbook was born. Yes, it's good. It's it's really good. And I think um, to your point as well, I've got a couple of notes. I never, um, I never make notes. I never prepare. Um, I never do that thing on a podcast. I love exploring, but I I have for yours because I really wanted to get down to the crux of some of the stuff you were talking about. Um, And I think one of the things you, you have just stated, but you also continue to state in the, are we going to call it a pocketbook from here? (laughs) We can call it. Yeah, a- let's call it a pocketbook. Cool. Yes, let's yeah, do it. Pocketbook. We'll call it a pocketbook. One of the things you state in the pocketbook is the, the necessity of bringing men to this conversation. So where where did that 
um, kind of sense of awareness come from and, and why is it so hard? <sighs> yes. Well, where did it come from? It came from doing this work with women in women's groups and speaking more around the idea of women in leadership and equality and presenting keynote presentations at women in conferences. So women in leadership, women in tech, women in finance, right? So, mm. uh, there are a lot of conferences for women by women and, and inevitably there's always a speaker on stage and often it's me that says, happy to be talking about this, really excited that we're paying attention to this and investing in this topic. Where are the men? Mm. Where are the men? Right? Cause if we don't have men in the room, how are we going to shift the system? So the reason that men are so important in this dialogue is because they represent the current system. It's as simple as that. You know, whether we like it or not, men are um, overrepresented and women are underrepresented in most powerful positions, whether it's corporate, whether it's media, whether it's government. We have more men in charge than we have women. Simple. That's how mm -hmm. it is. So a lot of what we're seeing in terms of the, um, the imbalance or the inequity is that it's not because women aren't capable or they're not experienced enough or they can't do the job. There is systemic bias in place that keeps women out of those positions. So if it's not about the women themselves, it's not, I always like to say, it's not about the sisters, it's about the system. <laughs> so if it's not about the system, the sisters, and it's about the system, then ergo, it has to be about the men. Mm -hmm. because the men are the system. Mm. But, and herein lies the rub, and this is what you say, so why then aren't there more men in this conversation? <laughs> well, what is the conversation for the men? Unless, So what I've noticed is unless you are a diversity champion, unless you are required by the board or by your stakeholders to show the investment you're putting in this conversation, there's not enough imperative right now for people to really invest in these conversations in a way that's going to really shift the system. And it's too easy to tick the box and it's too easy to say all the right things, mm. but really not do enough. And one of the issues I noticed is that men don't actually understand the real problem. And that's the main problem. And I don't mean that by way of, I don't intellectually understand. I think we all understand, you know, we can see there are more men at the top and there are less women. We have an imbalance. How do we right that wrong? Right. That's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of business cases out there. We've got all the stats and data in the world. We're not lacking for the data to show what this need is about, but what we're lacking is an, is an understanding on a personal level about what's really happening on a day-to-day -day basis that is perpetuating and creating this cycle. So the metaphor I like to share to sort of help men get into the idea of how it's actually, uh, how, what part they have to play basically. Yeah. Because it's really easy to go, well, I support women. I have a wife. I've got daughters. I think everything should be equal isn't it? <laughs> like, what, like, what else do I do? Right. Okay. Exactly. And I get that. I get that a lot. So uh, what do you want me to do actually? So first of all, here's the metaphor I share with people, particularly in my keynotes. And it's also in the book. So FYI people, this is in the book. Yes, and the metaphor the book, the is book. this <laughs> by the book. So I talk about the idea of a tall shopper and a short shopper. Yeah. So you've got a tall yep, shopper going into, here, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Good. So you've got two people going into the supermarket to buy their weekly groceries. Both of these people have $50 or $150, whatever you have. So you got hundred dollars to buy your groceries for the week. The tall shopper and the short shopper both enter the supermarket and have a very different experience. So the tall person grabs anything they want off the shelf, puts it in their basket and away they go. The short shopper, and I know this from experience because I am only five foot two. The short shopper <laughs> has a very, <laughs> has a bit, I always look big, bigger on yeah, two. Um, I've, got this, I've got this really interesting thing going on here. It's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll stay I here. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a short person in disguise online. It's so wonderful, right? <laughs> uh, the power of technology. Yeah. So uh, when you are a short shopper, you enter the supermarket and your experience is vastly different. So for me, if I want something on the top shelf, I either have to wait for a kindly stranger with long gangly arms to reach it for me. 
I have to risk my life and Lima try and climb up the shelves. I have tried on occasion. I admit I've tried a couple of those things or I forego that product. So I either don't get the best product or I get a more expensive product or basically something that I just didn't want. So there are all these invisible obstacles for me in that exercise of just trying to buy my groceries for the week. Mm. So when the tall person and the short person exit the supermarket, the tall person looks across at, for example, my shopping trolley and says, we both spent $100. We both got groceries for the week. I don't see the inequity. And that's the problem. Mm. It's hard for men to see the inequity when they are not at the effects of it. Mm -hmm. So for example, if a woman, um, you can, um, if you replace a woman's name with a man's name on a CV, the -hmm. chances of getting hired, the odds of getting hired go up by 71%. Now as a man, yeah, it was right. Mm -hmm. As a man, you wouldn't know what it's like to not have a male name and therefore not get on a short list and Mm -hmm. not get on, you know, the hiring list as it were. So because you're not at the effect of it, you don't know what women are missing out on. And Mm. unless we're having these conversations to say, hey, short shopper, what took you so long? (laughs) You know, or why did you buy that brand over that brand? Unless men are asking questions to say, hey, what's your lived experience of being a short shopper in this supermarket? Help me understand because right now on the surface, it just... I don't see the difference. And so this is what I like to say about men. Men are not bad. They are blinkered. They're blinkered to the experience of being a woman. Of course. Impossible not to be. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we have to kind of get around here is that when you say something like that, this is not a thing of, um, as you just said, men are bad. It's like, it's, it's a thing of, we all need to learn from each other. We all have different and interesting experiences. And one of the things that I found as well, I wrote this down, so I actually wrote women's name, man's name, 71% increase of being of hired. One of the other things that I found really interesting was this clear feedback um, um, yeah. data that you, you put in the book. Could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. Which piece in particular Well, are you interested the, in? Well, there was, there was a piece in there that you wrote about how women find it difficult on the whole to get clear, concise feedback um, mm-hmm. from male managers from memory, I think. Um Yes, and I yes. found that really interesting because it kind of goes into my previous question of um, why aren't men interested in these kinds of conversations? Because then, and I'll, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Another point that you made was men are inherently competitive and, you know, and we can go into the biology of that, you know, 15 times the level of testosterone than women on the whole. Um, but then my, always my thought for that would be, well, if there are more people trying to get at it, it's going to be exciting. So let's, let's fucking do it. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, bring on the competition. I love that. Of course. Nice. Nice. (laughs) Right. So that's, that's actually a healthy attitude. And in fact, it's, it's a a more useful attitude than the zero sum game. But anyway, Mm -hmm. let's, let's park that. And I want to come back to your first question. So you asked about, yes, the feedback. So what we know is that women are more likely to get vague developmental feedback. So for example, Mm. in performance review conversations and things like that. So women get vague feedback, which means they don't know how they're supposed to improve. That's one thing. So women, so that's one thing. Um, And, and I have hypothesis around that, but there's nothing concrete from evidence, you know, in in terms of what's based in research. But I sometimes, I sometimes wonder if men don't want to hurt women's feelings. I was just going to say they, that. Could it be as, as simple as that? Right. Really? Yeah, which sucks. It's shitty. Well, my, yeah, and, and, and that, that's actually what I wonder about. Yeah, is it you don't, I mean, often men say to me, I, I, I don't want to make her cry. I don't want to upset her. Um, I don't know how she's going to respond. And men seem to be on the whole quite scared of women's tears, particularly in the workplace. And the interesting mm-hmm. thing about that is I can tell you right now, women don't want to cry in the workplace. So everyone is scared of women's tears. <laughs> good point. <laughs> That's a good right? point. It's, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. So women get more vague feedback, which means they don't know how to improve their performance, which might be a reason that they're held back. Another thing in terms of work feedback is that men are more likely to get feedback based on business acumen, technical skills, how to become better at the work. 
-hmm. And women are more likely to get feedback based on how they communicate their style. They get more feedback based on uh, more words in their performance reviews saying they need to tone it down. They need to be less Mm -hmm. aggressive. They need to be more confident. Women are two to three times more likely to be told that they need to show more confidence. So there's a whole lot of inequity in how we are supporting people to develop, let alone, you know, hire or put them into positions of power. Mm, That's interesting. It's really interesting actually. And confidence, I mean, that's so ambiguous as well. You know, it's like, you need to show more confidence. Like where, where, unless you come from a psychological background, where do you begin with that? Okay, I'll start, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. find that really interesting. Oh, confident. So the difference there you mean like is, this? Exactly. Exactly yes. right. Yeah. It's just, it's so hard to quantify. So, so the difference there fundamentally mm. is that men tend to get this kind of, look, we need you to do this, this, and this. So it's very tangible. It's, it's clear. Yes. And the difference on the side is yes. kind of personality and character trait, which, yes. which shows sexism as well, because it becomes about the person as opposed to their output. Right. And so, and there's a number of things happening in that space. So obviously if you're focusing on giving people feedback on how to perform better in the job, they're going to perform better in the job. Mm -hmm. The manager is also now primed to pay attention to this person being better at their job. So Mm -hmm. they're going to notice when they're performing better. And of course that's better for their career. If the manager is saying you need to, to the woman, you need to show more confidence or you need to be less aggressive or you need to be more war, you need to smile more, all these sorts of things about her style, then that is what they're primed to now notice. It's not about her performance. It's not about her capability. So already there's an equity sitting on that space. Mm. But one of the reasons that this shows up is that women face this double bind. And the double bind is you are either seen as a, a female. So the stereotypical female is warm, nurturing, caring, supportive, putting others first, all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, you are either seen to be a nice, warm female, which is why there's a lot of feedback in performance reviews that are around style and communication choices and being softer and um, not being so aggressive, not being so direct, not being so hard, right? Yeah. Because you're you're breaking the gender stereotype of being amenable, polite, likable. Mm, mm. Then the other side, so if then you stay in that in that uh, gender expectation, then the double bind kicks in because if you're seen as female, you're not seen as leader-like mm. because leader-like is the opposite. It's strong, it's assertive, it's dominant, it's authoritative. So women actually, they're either damned if they do and damned if they don't. So they face this double bind where um, there isn't a nice middle ground. There is your, if you are too much in the feminine space, too nice, amenable, pleasing, you're seen as not being competent. Mm -hmm. That's the trade-off. And if you are highly competent, you are seen as a leader, then you must be cold. You must be a real bitch. Wow, what a ball breaker she is, right? And we've seen this. We see it in the media all the time. So you are the likable or you're leader-like, but you can't be both. And if you do, the, the way to be both is to be both. You have to be both warm and likable and authoritative and strong together. Mm-hmm. You can't mm-hmm. have one or the other or you're penalised. And that's hard. Hello, that's so- really hard. <laughs> It's, it's hard, exhausting. It's hard to not be who you are. But I also don't like the fact that we associate these ideas of leadership with dominance and, and tyranny and this, yes. idea, this kind of like Steve Jobs, um, get it done or you'll be fired kind of bullshit, you know, because there's, <laughs> any, there's a lot of stuff that's coming out in the world now is this idea of the business and entrepreneurship and, um, you know, the, the, the corporate life, the work life. It should be, you're there like, nearly all your life or at least half of it, it should be fun. Yes. There are other ways. There are more compassionate ways of getting people to do things rather than just barking orders, man or woman, you know, it's not something mm-hmm. I really want to do. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, again, there is research to suggest that typical female traits, typical female traits are the most effective leadership traits. You think about it, collaboration, being supportive. You know, these are typically female mm-hmm, traits. Mm-hmm. And I know that there are ways that women work 
that are very effective in in the areas that they really need to be. So areas of politics, areas of um, government and social, like social change and stuff like that. So women operate in different ways and it, and it really does work. And it's, you're right. It's a shame that the only model that we have or that we hold up, the only model we really exalt, you know, that we hold up in the minds as being leadership is that of the dominant or the Don Draper type, you know, that there's like one stereotypical strong way. And not only does it marginalize women and their preferences, because, because remember, this isn't actually, those behaviors are not men and women. It's Mm -hmm. mostly men and mostly women, but there are men who act more like women and women who act more like men. So, and what happens is not only are we marginalizing women in that way, by not saying, Hey, leadership can be done in a different way and an equally successful way. So let's yes. broaden our idea about what that means. But we're also marginalizing men who mm-hmm. don't want to operate like that. Mm-hmm. Quiet men, introverted men, um, men who would rather take a different approach, men who want to lead from behind and don't want to be at the front. You know, all, all choices are valid, but you're right. It seems like we only have this lens for leaders of a certain breed. And it's, a, it's such a shame, actually. It, it is a real shame and it's, it's, I find it interesting that I'm, I'm actually very uh, naive in this area because I've never worked in the corporate sphere. I've only ever worked small business. Um, I've had a lot of uh, female bosses um, and now I kind of work at home as, as we all do, you know, do our own yes. along, with my, along with my partner as well. So I'm super naive. So it was actually really quite interesting reading this pocketbook of yours. I'm like, what? Mm. This is bizarre. This is very bizarre. So, um, but I I really, I, I, I find it, I just find it really quite interesting, I suppose. Um, I don't know. It it just seems quite outdated to me. It just, uh, look, for lack of a better way of saying it, it seems like a lot about what we're talking about is relatively obvious. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You would think Tom, mm, mm. you would think, but I, I think that's, that's the problem is it seems obvious. It seems obvious. We don't have enough women in leadership. Just put them there. Mm-hmm. Like, well, you know, like it doesn't seem so hard. We have a pay gap. Mm-hmm. Just close it. Like, I don't, it just feels like the solution should be simple, mm. but it's not because we're talking about culture change. We're mm. talking about changing behaviors. We're talking about challenging identities. One of the issues that we face is that um, it's not only women who face backlash when they are acting outside of their own um, stereotype, for example, right? So the warm, nurturing, n- nurturing, the, wor- the warm, yes. warm, nurturing female. Yes. But men also face this social backlash when they operate outside of their traditional stereotype. So what we actually need is more men to come out of the workforce and help with the home care duties and let more women into the workforce who don't have to be doing the home care duties. That is one of the big things, that, the barriers that keep women out of the higher roles. So if we had more mm-hmm. equality in the home, and when I say men out of the work, I mean, you don't have to leave, right? Calm down. You don't have to leave. I'm saying, you know, maybe take some paternity leave or you take a year off and they take a year off or whatever it is, right? But mm-hmm. also, so we're sharing the early early year home care. And we're also sharing the emotional load of what it takes to manage a household kids sporting activities, doing the lunches, school drop-offs, pickups, you know, all the managing stuff. It's not just, I pick my kids up once a week. No, 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 no. Do you know when they go to the dentist, where the school, you know, all those things. So if we have equality in the home front, then we have equality in the workplace. But the men right now are facing a backlash for leaving, i.e. if they want to do those sorts of activities, they want extended parental leave or they want carer's leave or anything that is a typical female activity. Mm-hmm. I've heard some men say to me, um, I, I applied for it and I was told flat out that's a career limiting move. How serious are you about this job? Jesus. Because that's not a, that's not a man's role. A man's role is the Don Draper role from Mad Men. You know, you turn up to work, you work hard and you've got all the support in the background to enable you to do that work. That's your role as the man. In fact, it's, it's the always on, over time, all the time, 
I can travel whenever is required. I am available whenever you need because that's what's required to get ahead. And, 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 you know, when we talk about getting more men out of that system and more women into the system and what we have then is, is people in the system who actually want a more balanced life. If you want to sort of, (laughs) Yeah, balance the home life. You get to balance the work life. Who wants to be on a conference call at 11 p.m. at night? Man or I woman. I don't. It's a shit. That, Man or like, woman. <laughs> absolutely. That sounds awful. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. But And so men are sacrificing as well. And one of the issues that I hear is, you know, um, I don't like that women are having so much focus, you know, are we really doing that? This is another one of the concerns. Are we really doing the right thing by putting so much focus into women, so much investment into women, isn't that now just the opposite problem? Isn't this now just at the expense of men? And so men can be feeling like they are now being left out of the equation, yeah, because they're not getting access to those opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I say, do you want those opportunities? Would would you like to take a sabbatical? Would you like to start a side hustle? Would you like to broaden your career choices? I mean, it, it might not be great to not get the job you always thought you were going to have because now they're letting more women in. And I would also argue to the fact that what's the difference? Competition is competition. Like bring on the competition as, (laughs) as be your um, statement before. But you know, if we're talking, if we're talking about what made you think that job was going to be yours anyway, it was either going to go to another man or another woman. Does it matter that it went to another woman? It went to another candidate. Exactly. So this is, and, and, you know, to your point here, this is that exact, this is that kind of, um, this is that argument I have, or my opinion, I suppose, against that kind <laughs> of uh, multiculturalism um, resistance where people say, oh, you know, if they, we let more people into the country, they'll, they'll steal our, all our jobs. And it's like, mate, work harder. <laughs> right. Be better. Make it happen. Exactly. Just be better. Make it happen. Nice. Yeah. yeah. In the and, words and of if you Michelle Obama. It, be better. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But if you really enjoy yeah. the job, you will find it within you to, to go above and beyond because it's fun. And this is, again, what I just find this. So um, I just find it really interesting that this is kind of still happening. I'm really naive about this. <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, how do you stay positive in this kind of work? Like it, it's very, I can, the, the passion the necessity is clearly there. So the purpose and the intrinsic meaning is all there. But when you're kind of met with these consistent forces of resistance, is it hard for you to sometimes be like, man, this is just getting insane? (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's a really good question. And I think it's important to address the reality of the movement, if I were to be so bold as to call it that. So one of my clients the other day, you know, we're looking at introducing an inclusive leadership program. And, and she said to me, you know, what do we do with the people who are are really going to be resistant to this? You know, how do we make sure everyone really comes on board and comes with us on the journey? I mean, this is a massive organization. Mm -hmm. And I said, we don't. Short answer, we don't. So if you think about it, we, we, we've got, we're dealing with a population. I think of everything like it's a bell curve, yeah? Mm-hmm. So we've got a bell curve. Um, the response ladder in the book that I talk about, so I, I've, I've come up with this ladder, which is yeah. men's response, yep, yeah, to the rise of women in power. And that's essentially a bell curve, except for it's a ladder, but, you know, you can turn <laughs> it on its side and make it a bell curve. <laughs> so the idea is that using that as the analogy, you've got men at one end who are, saboteurs they're not interested in equality they, they think that they're going to lose their job they don't understand why women women want to get out of the kitchen like they are just they are not on board with the movement right. yeah and I go they're not everywhere but they do still exist you know it's it's one organization it's one leader it's one small company they do still exist in pockets so they're not my market People Mm -hmm. who think like that and believe that are never going to be swayed by any argument that I have to bring to the table. So Mm -hmm. I don't bother. I'm like, saboteurs, you're locked and loaded. Good for you. Stay there. Happy days. Yeah. (laughs) Then we've got, then we've got all these men in the middle. We've got all, so it's the, um, uh, the middle majority. I can't remember the marketing term for it, but, but basically these are the people who could be swayed either way by a good argument. 
And in the book, I talk about these people as being the, you know, the searchers and supporters and, and the sponsors. So they are interested, curious, maybe hesitant, maybe unsure, maybe doing the right things, not exactly sure what the difference is, but they're going to do it anyway. You know, they're sort of on a, on a spectrum. So those people with the right conversations, access to the right information and the right stories are more likely to come on board. And what we've got at the top end are the champions. And again, I'm not interested in the champions because they're also locked and loaded. They yeah. are. This is awesome, <laughs> right? Totally. Come on, everybody. Toot, toot. We're, we're on the train. So the saboteurs and the champions are not my business. It's the men in the middle that I'm interested in. And so when you say, how do I stay positive? You know, how do I keep going with these kinds of responses? I compartmentalize and I know who I'm going to be most effective with. And there will be people out there who think what I say is a load of crap and it doesn't matter what evidence I put forward or what stories I put forward. It's not going to make a difference. And they're not my market. Mm. And that's cool. I suppose my, I suppose my worry with um, hearing those kinds of stories of people that are, you know, in that saboteur category or, or people that are in the middle or perhaps hesitant or fearful. And I can understand the, the fear because, you know, there's, there's a, such a funny world of political correctness in this day and age where if you say the wrong thing, you're outed and fired. And it's so scary to me because we can't get to the crux of issues if we don't practice this kind of critical thinking and be willing to potentially offend for the sake of good intention. And it's like, you, you can tell the difference between someone who is just being provocative and just being a dickhead. And as opposed to someone <laughs> that is, but as yeah. opposed to someone that's like genuinely interested and may mm. say something potentially offensive, but is actually just keen mm-hmm. to get to the truth. And it, it worries me um, when we start talking about people that, uh, you know, to your point, the bell curve, the majority of people are in this area that could be swayed and yes. that we could get them over to the other side or whatever they want. What like I, Just, just mm-hmm. as long as they actually start joining the conversation. And we're seeing a lot of this lack of joining the conversation, this increased polarization, especially in America. Mm. That freaks the shit out of me. I don't want that to happen over here. <laughs> so we need more people talking. Yes, exactly. You are so right. And I am a hundred percent with you. It really, it disturbs me mm. greatly to see the polarization because it's the exact opposite of what has to happen in the world right now a hundred percent and it is very very frightening and it's it's almost like we are becoming less able to to challenge alternate views and and that's really difficult because how on earth do we ever come together if we have opposite views yeah exactly how do we learn and so I, i like to introduce this idea of the imperfect ally particularly in this space around gender equality. So mm, yes. the imperfect ally, yeah, so it, it's good. it's an invitation to men to say, stuff it up, ask the awkward question, ask it in a terrible way, you know, but ask it from a genuine place. Show up with your full intent and say, I, I want to learn more about this. Please help me understand your experience. Um, and I apologize if I say something offensive, I'm not quite sure what the language is. I'm finding my feet here, but I yeah. really want to be in dialogue with you about this. So is that cool? I can't Brilliant. think of a single woman who wouldn't go, hell's yeah, it's about Let's time. It. Let's have a chat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, for so long, they haven't even been afforded the opportunity to express their, their truth and, you know, their, their side of what's going on. You know, it's just been that class ceiling yes. That's where the phrase comes from. <laughs> Right, right. And and here's the interesting thing. So people don't, you're less likely to want to hear someone if you don't feel heard. So if we want, for example, so here's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Women want men to hear them. Yeah. Because men are in positions of power and they have greater access to do things for the greater good. Yes. Mm-hmm. So women want to be heard. So Here's what we want to happen. Here are all the issues. If you pay attention and listen to what we're saying, maybe you'll get on board and you'll see the need and, you know, you can kind of be part of the movement. But men don't feel, and I've come like I'm talking about all men like I am men. A, I'm not a man and I can't speak for all men. But I've done a bit of research around this and I can say from in terms of behavioural patterns, human behaviour patterns, here's what I know to be true. So I... If I'm, I'm a woman and I'm wanting a man to hear me, I'm a man in this 
conversation today. And I'm, I'm actually, um, I am operating in the result of systemic bias, second generation bias that I inherited. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually turning up to work every day going, I'm a good husband. I'm a good father. I think I'm a good leader. I try hard. I'm not sure I see everything that's going on, but I feel like I'm a good bloke. I'm a good guy. And so when we are having these conversations about, you know, it's not right for women, it needs to be different for women, a little piece of me feels a bit blamed and I feel a bit responsible and now I start to feel guilty and I actually start to, I start to go into my shell because I feel the wrath of the women of hundreds of years of oppression, right? And, and, and now women are getting a voice and it's becoming much stronger. And, of course, I do not forgive men one iota for, for feeling like that voice is coming at them. Mm-hmm. But it's actually not at them. It's at the system which they can control and they can stand for and change and challenge. So whilst it's not them personally, it is them positionally, if I could say. They can do something in their position of power, but it doesn't mean they created the system from 200 years ago. That's the difference. And until men can depersonalise the issues that we're currently solving from you being a bad man who created it, we're never going to be able to have the conversations. So when I say everyone wants to feel heard, Right now, I feel like we need to create a space for men to be heard, to have the opportunity to say, I'm really sorry for what's happened. I don't feel responsible necessarily, but I am here to help. So I, don't, I just don't want to be blamed. How, how, and it doesn't feel safe to enter this conversation because I, I feel your anger or I feel your you know, discontent. And I, to be frank, I just don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. Mm. And, you know, the irony of that when I'm hearing you talk is that the irony of these kind of gender stereotypes of men, you know, being brave and courageous is that, well, if you can't even jump in on a little conversation, <laughs> but, <laughs> but look, the, 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 the thing that scares me about this world right now is that this is one of the things, one of the reasons why I really want to talk with you. And I have to shout out to my mum who will be listening to this. Thank you, mum, for getting us in touch. I love you very much. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk with you was because it's very cool that you're doing work that's targeting men as opposed to just being at like, and there's nothing wrong with women doing women's empowerment and all that sort of stuff, but you're totally right. If we don't address the systemic issue, we, we can do that and that's brilliant, but we probably won't actually see any change. And what, what worries me about this lack of conversation, you know, I, I'm just, you know, let's be as diplomatic as possible. Let's talk for the next 15 years if we have to, but let's just talk. And so we don't start hating each other because the flip side mm. of guilt is resentment. And then you start to see mm. these you kind of male movements going on where it's like, oh, you know, fuck yes. and, and this and that. And it's like, we, we don't yes. need that. We, that is so, so toxic in, in a time yep. where so much, I always just think, right. I'm always just like, man, we could, if we just got this world peace shit organized, we could start exploring <laughs> space. Let's just, we just yes. have to start talking, you know? Right, right. Imagine what we could do with our collective brains exactly. if we were all focused on doing something cool instead of totally. hating each other and killing each other. I know. <laughs> and, and look, you're so right. And there's something about giving voice to a marginalized group. So it is now, dare I say, cool, uh, in vogue to give voice to minorities, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. And, and about time too. So the Black Lives Matter movement, we've got the women's movement, we've got LG, LGBTQI QI, movement, yes. we've got, yep. did I do that right? Right. I think, yep, we got there in the end, you and I. Not great with the alphabets there, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, so we've got these movements coming through and so people are now, um, it's, it's almost like we get, that 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 happens we un- yes. you know it's it's not um it's not a shock right that, that these mm. groups are mobilizing now right because this is the li- this is the world that we live in this is what's happening right now but so what's actually happening is that the marginalized groups uh it's become mainstream to be a marginalized group to, you know fighting to become part of the mainstream so we understand yeah. that what we have less understanding around is how the mainstream then feel marginalized and on the outer 
as a result of all this attention that's given to these marginalised groups. Mm -hmm. If people are trying to do the right thing by investing and supporting and all the things that we should be doing, because remember, as I said, if I'm a man and I just don't think I'm doing anything wrong, here's what happens. that The messages that come across are things like, well, um, you know, women need support. Maybe it's a quota discussion. So we're going to put a woman in because we need to hit the quota. And the man says, well, how is that fair? I have worked really hard my whole life. So I don't understand how someone should get privileged over me because you tell me I've got male privilege or white privilege or whatever the privilege I have. You tell me I've got privilege, but it doesn't feel very privileged right now. I feel like I'm being persecuted because I've worked hard. I've sacrificed. I haven't seen my kids. I've had to be the Don Draper type. I didn't want to do all those late night phone calls. Like I've had it hard as well. So you're telling me that I'm privileged, but I don't feel it. And that's the issue that we're solved. That's really the problem that we've got. Mm. Because until we can create an avenue where that voice gets to come out and says, hey, this is how it feels for me, we can't transform. So you may have heard of the saying, Mm. I heard it on a podcast, Brené Brown. Uh, She interviewed someone, a father, someone, and it was something like he said, pain not transformed is transferred. So if we don't, A, Mm. allow the space for that pain to come Mm. out, we can't transform it. Mm. That's so true. So what, what, um, what do you say to, to, to men that say that? Because I I can, I can hear that. You can hear that voice. You can hear the the truth and the pain in that voice. So, um, what, what, what is a good response or what's something that's shown to be, um, you know, build that bridge? Well, the first thing is not to invalidate that. Mm-hmm. So, and, and this is where it bec- can become tricky. So if men and women aren't schooled or practiced in the art of conflict dialogue or, <laughs> you know, holding opposing ideas and all the things that it seems like most people can't do nowadays, mm-hmm. then this is a the kind of conversation that becomes tricky because mm-hmm. both sides of that party feel like they're not heard. We're disadvantaged. You're not listening well, I've had it tough too. You're not listening. Now, who wants to listen to the other? No one. So remember, as I said before, if you don't feel heard, you don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. So what we need to get to is someone has to go first. We need to create the space that says, I validate your perspective. I hear what you're saying. And, and, And what I'm sharing is not to take away from your experience. I'm sorry that you've had to work hard. If we can bring to the conversation better choices for everybody, if we can introduce policies and procedures at that executive level where you don't have to have conference calls at 11 and you don't have to travel for three months at a time because you've got home care duties like the rest of us, well, wouldn't that be better for all of us? And then you won't have to sacrifice and we won't have to sacrifice. So what is that common ground that lets us both transform this pain into something more useful? Yeah, that's awesome. I really, I really like that. And, you know, it's a... It's a funny one. I, I wanted to get to the subject of quotas because this is a this is a um, this is a part where I, yeah I think I, it's a, it's a really important area I think to learn right now because at, at on one side of the thing we don't want people to lose at based off on what we just what we've just been talking about we don't want people to lose out um, purely for the sake of them you know being a man or whatever it is being in positions of um, systemic power you know whatever it is but then on the other side and i and you know this is where i would probably sound more progressive in this area that if if we if we never if we can never reach a, a level of um you know uh, uh diversity ideas um a, a more representative um uh power system or you know powers is fucking baggage word now sorry i swear a lot um, <laughs> you know but just a, an area where we're actually able to listen and create policies as you say with all different ideas we're never going to um create the kind of utopian society that we, that we really want so um you know what, what what are kind of the 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 pros and cons with quotas and and, and how does that kind of come into yeah. your work it comes into my work a lot so mm. i have this conversation a lot as you can imagine right so mm-hmm. um there are people who are very polarized on this. Surprise, surprise. This is the world we live in. People are very polarized. We have very clear perspectives on these arguments. So interestingly, in my early days, in my youth, Tom, in my youth, uh, I was, I was anti quota just because I didn't understand anything about it really. And I just heard what it meant to me on the outside, which was 
just put a woman in the role, right? Over just like make sure it's a woman for the job and um, discount all the men. And I thought, oh God, I never want to be put in as a quota role. What? Because why? I mean, what if I can't do the role? Yeah, exactly. Develops my worth, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So my initial response was a knee jerk reaction as a woman to say, I wouldn't want that that position. And I have a lot of women on my program say, oh, you know, I've been asked to, to put, be put forward for this quota appointment. And I, I don't want to be a quota appointment. I want to get it on my own merit. And, and so then I have this conversation. I say, okay, you could do that. And you could not have that role. And you could not make the impact that you could make if you had that role. So let me ask you one question. Do you think you can do the role? And would you do a good job? And if they say yes, then I go, you take that damn quota appointment because if you've been in that role for a couple of months and you're starting to make waves and you're starting to make the difference that only you can make and you're getting traction, they're going to forget that you're a quota appointment. You're Mm -hmm. only ever a quota appointment if you're rubbish. And if you know you're rubbish, don't take the role. (laughs) (laughs) Like (laughs) save everybody the trouble. So that's from one perspective. That's for women going into quota appointments. So I'm all for them. The reason I'm all for them is because you're right. If we left it up to people with good intentions, we're never going to get there. So I, I, in one of my keynote presentations, I tell this story of the good Samaritan. So the good Samaritan is basically a story where, uh, to cut a long story short, a person is on the ground needing help and someone who is on their way to deliver a sermon about being a good Samaritan steps over the person in help (laughs) who needs help um, on their way to give this speech because they're running late. Mm -hmm. And so I say your good intentions mean nothing. It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters how you behave. And And the truth of the matter is we're too busy we're overwhelmed, we're overworked, we're stressed. We cannot leave things to good intentions because they never get done. That's why we have to structure them. We have to sort them into our ways of being so that we take choice off the table. If you want to be diligent at taking medicine every day, you don't leave it somewhere random that you have to remember it. You put it by your toothbrush. You make it part of your system. You brush your teeth, you take your pill. You take the thinking and remembering out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens for things like Um, doing the right thing with equity. So quota appointments, I say, yes, bring it on. Because if we leave it to hiring managers to make the right decisions or do the right thing or remember to check their biases and all that kind of stuff, I tell you now, they're busy. They've got, I see it all the time. Look, I just need someone. I need this up and running. I need it next week. I've got Bob. I know Bob. I trust him. I've worked with him before. It's just so easy. And I don't, I do not um, hold that against them because I would do exactly the same thing. It's human nature. Why wouldn't you? It's an easy solution and you know it's going to be a good solution. But in the long term, it may not be the right solution. And Mm. therein lies the problem. So men may feel disadvantaged because they'll look across and go, well, of course, that puts me at a disadvantage. If 50% of the roles are going to be women, I now have only access to this 50%. I would argue you should have only ever had access to that 50% in the first place because shouldn't it have been an equal pool to begin with, Mm -hmm. right? But we don't have the equal pool to begin with, so we are manufacturing one. The other thing too is once you start, so you need, we also have this this, um, issue called tokenism, which I love that word, so tokenism. So this is around the token female you know, the token female on the committee, the token female on the board. So oh, we've, we've got a woman, tick diversity. You know, we've got someone from an Indian background, tick, we've got cultural diversity. Yeah. No, it doesn't work that way. So um, then they go, oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't do that. I'll put two women on the board. <laughs> so, tukinism. I love it. So now, <laughs> tukinism. Awesome. So now we have tukinism. So we've got our two because it's not one because that's just, you know, trite. But now we've got two, so we're all good to go. But what happens is, You've got one person, they're different. Two people, they're still too different. Unless you have like a 60, 40 or somewhere between then, it doesn't normalize difference. If you only have one representation of difference, they are different. Mm -hmm. But if you have difference, lots of difference, there is just diversity. Yeah. And that normalizes 
the, the difference in the room. And then it takes the issue of quotas and stuff like that off the table, but we'll never get there believing that we're good people and we can make it happen through good intentions. It just doesn't mm. work. It's too slow. It, it's just too slow. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And and I think, um, you know, it, it might be worthwhile saying to perhaps some of the blokes out there that are still potentially resistant to what we're talking about here is that we'd be just, we'd be talking about the same thing with women if it was a largely matriarchal system, you know, where it was mostly women up there. Because what we're talking about here is intellectual diversity and uh, difference of opinion, because that's going to be the best way that we can all move forward collectively. It's not men and women. And it, 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 yeah, I, I, um, I find it interesting that you're, you're still working with managers and people that are just trying to hit the quota checklist and hit the tick because then it, I keep coming back to this point, Annalie, I'm really sorry, but it does frighten me that it's just like, okay, well, I'll just do that to get that done without actually listening to the crux of the issue here. I mean, you know, this is, we haven't even hit an hour, you know, it doesn't even need to take an hour for, for someone to perfectly mm. lay their points out and there's like, oh, that's really interesting. And then if you still don't get it, it's totally fine. We, we want the conversation, but you might need to go back and do your research and, and mm. come to understand this is the Jungian or the Gestalt in us, mm-hmm. but come to understand yes. why those subconscious barriers are, are coming out as external projections. Yes. And that's why whenever I, so I, as I say, when I'm running my women at work programs, I'm very, very adamant to position very clearly up front. This is not us against them. This is not men against women. Men are not bad. Women are not broken. All of that stuff is nothing to do with this kind of conversation. In fact, what we're dealing with really is a majority system against a minority system. That's mm-hmm. all it is. And you can put in there race, color, creed, sexuality, height, anything you want. It doesn't matter. The dynamics are the same. And so we have to make sure that we don't personalize it. That's why mm-hmm. we need to be able to make sure it's not personalized because it isn't about men as a gender and women as a gender. It, and you're right, if it was the opposite, it would be the opposite. In fact, to make the case, I talk about the idea that men are experiencing the same level of social backlash when they, remember when they're operating outside their social, socially agreed stereotypes. So, mm. And there is also systemic bias for men in simple things like, um, one of my clients told me that he was a stay-at-home dad for a year with his daughter and he he belonged to kind of like a, a dad's group mm-hmm. and they had determined as a group, as the, the lay of the land, they had plotted which shopping centres they could attend that had the parents' change room and not the baby change room in the women's toilets mm. because there are shopping centres out there that still have the baby's change rooms as wow. part of the women's toilets. So they weren't able to change their babies at certain supermarkets or shopping centres, so they didn't go there. Wow. It was like this underground movement of, you know, <laughs> the yeah. dad's brigade. Changing that. Right? You, <laughs> That's <laughs> This hilarious. is stuff you need to know. That's so crazy. It, that is a perfect example of it systemic is. bias. So what that means is the people who built that infrastructure, who designed the engineers, the, everyone involved in that assumed women would take care of the babies. Yeah. That's what happened. So there were no men in that conversation that said, hang on a second, I take care of my baby. Mm. So how am I going to change my baby if I'm the one taking care of my baby? Mm. And there were no women in there going, hang on, I'm on this committee and I don't take care of my baby. My husband does. So how, how is he going to do that? Mm. That's why it's critical to have an equal representation of voices in the decision-making forums mm. so that those default situations are challenged by the people in the room going, how is this, this isn't going to work for me and I'm a representation of what's out there in community. So we need to do something different. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a perfect example. Um, And a question, what do you, when you're doing your presentations and things, do you ever get women that uh, are resistant to what you're saying? Not generally. So normally I I do a presentation called leading women. So one of my keynotes is a leading women keynote and it's essentially 
aimed at helping people understand all the things that we've talked about today, Mm -hmm. helping them understand that it's not about people being good or bad and how easy it is to be biased and overlook things. And I give lots of examples of how women do it and how men do it so that people go, oh, yeah, Mm -hmm. I do that. And and I get to normalise it and remove the stigma, right, of being bad. And so in that, mostly the responses from the audience is that women are like, <laughs> what she says, what she says. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the men, they're going, is that a thing? Like the short yeah. shopper? I just, wow, I just, yeah, I never thought about it. Like I ask this one question, I say, okay, so um, in, and it was better when it was live. Do you remember the days? When, oh, when God. Don't even get me anyway, started. Anyway, so I remember the days. So I would, um, I would say to the audience, um, hands up if you've ever walked to your car in say an underground car park or something in the city and you're walking to your car and you put your car keys in between your hands. So you've got the key sticking out of your fist. Has anyone ever done that? And all the women's hands go up and there will be one or two men in the audience who put their hand up and I say rough neighborhood and they go, yep, rough neighborhood. And I say, okay, great. And, and I say, okay, so men look around. So men are looking around going, what is this thing you speak of? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? I've and so the whole, that. yeah, I've never heard of that. point. <laughs> yeah. Never heard of it. You ask any woman, this is your homework, Tom. You ask any woman, <laughs> have you ever, <laughs> have you ever walked to your car at any point in time in your life with your car keys? It's like the, un, it's like, you know, the dad's, you know, the dad's underground shopping network. Mm -hmm. It's the woman's underground security network. So we've been taught as girls, car parks are dangerous. And so you need to have like a weapon. We don't have weapons. So we have keys because it can either be a weapon or it can get you to your car really quickly. When I'm looking, so if I'm in that same car park and I am in uh, one of those dodgy lifts full with graffiti and smell like urine, you know, like it's not a great place to be and there's a couple Mm. of stories and it's late at night and uh, that lift opens, I am looking at who's in that lift and deciding whether or not I'm going to get in and I don't always get in and I don't know that men do that as much. Of Mm. course, there's always going to be times but I can tell you it's every time. It's every time. For a woman mm. in a public space, it's every time. I, I, I definitely would be freaked out if I was in that elevator scenario. But I think one, uh, uh, my partner Shimon and I were having a conversation about this kind of thing. Um, you know, it could have been a year ago or something. And um, she, she just off the cuff said something like, "Oh, uh, you know, um, uh, I'll just, I'll give you a call when I'm when I'm walking home or something." And uh, for whatever reason, she, she might've said that 20 times before or something, you know, but I'm, I, for whatever reason, I, I might've um, probed her a little bit more on the question. Like, Oh, you know, why, why would you call me? She's like, what do you mean? In the same way that you're talking about this idea that it's unfathomable that people like myself have never thought of a key <laughs> as a potential weapon, you know, but it's like, well, yes. you know, what, what if I get um, A, B and C, you know, and, I think yeah. before that conversation, I'd never really, I, I remember walking home from school, um, you know, 16, 17, 18, I'd pretty much grown to, to where I am now. Um, I had more hair. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I remember looking down the dark alleyways and going, here we go. And like, okay, can I face right. the fear? It was never against this time of like, would I be attacked? You know, which is crazy. Really? Crazy. Oh, that oh, blows my mind. Up. Totally. Totally. And that's a big issue. You know, now it's 2020. We can have the, we, we wow. don't need to, we, 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 I feel like the conversation, I love evolutionary biology. I love evolutionary psychology. I'm fascinated um, by the differences and why they are there. Everything from night owls to morning larks, those reasons and mm. testosterone in man yep. and, you know, whatever it is. Um, yep. But that kind of conversation now, um, because I think, I, one of the reasons I feel like men might have resistance to these kinds of conversations that we're having is because it's like, well, this is the way we're set up. You know, if, if we look yeah. at these kind of primal instincts, you know, we know that testosterone is equated to competitiveness and aggressiveness, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. but I would argue that competitiveness is not too bad, but aggressiveness is like, it's not necessarily a good trait. You know, that's something you want to keep in check. You definitely want to don't, yes. you don't want to use that at the workplace. I wouldn't want to be aggressive. Yes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want man, female, goat, scooter, 
to be aggressive to me. Yes. That's not nice. I wouldn't want to talk mm. with that person, you know? So And it's still a choice. Aggression is still, still a, a choice. choice. Absolutely yeah. right. You don't have to speak to people like that. And you certainly don't have to bring it back to, well, that I'm a man, I'm obviously going to be more aggressive. It's like, okay, cool. You might have certain proclivities, um, but that's not a good thing. And you certainly can't use that as an yeah. excuse to speak down to someone, man or woman. Mm. Mm-mm. Yeah. It's so funny. We don't really, so a couple of things going back to your question, you said, have I ever had any pushback from yes. women, which I think is a really interesting question. So in the general conversation, I just, I get lots of agreement and more sort of, wow, really from men, which is exactly what I want because I want them to feel like this is not their fault. And I want them mm-hmm. in, I want them curious and into the conversation and starting to ask questions. Um, the only pushback I get are questions that I've now, uh, because I'm now starting to talk from the men's perspective, mm-hmm. not just the woman's perspective is I'm getting questions um, from women around the idea of, huh? So, so, so you're giving men more airtime. Mm. haven't they had enough airtime <laughs> it's you know, like our our rise has not finished our work is not done are you diverting resources now to men that we still need and and my response to that is wow. you're not going to get any more unless men are on board totally. so this is actually a quality in the making um it can't be an either or it has to be a both and and remember we don't listen unless we feel heard. So we've got to make sure that people are, are feeling heard around that space. Um, wow. I didn't, I didn't expect that. That's so interesting how, how yeah. you know, we, we, maybe, maybe when you come back on the show, we can get into depth psychology and we start talking about the ego. But yeah. like that kind of how the ego only knows itself by relative position. Mm-hmm. So whenever something is said, mm-hmm. it's an automatic kind of unconscious defense of, you know, well, my ego or a certain aspect of my ego can't die. So I'm going to have to defend that. Correct. Yes, absolutely. And this is, this is, so my new identity now is as a warrior for equality and here's what we're going to do. And what I hear you say is that you're taking away some of our ammunition. Like you are Mm. weakening our argument because now you're giving it to the enemy, which is not the Mm. case. And they don't even believe that's the case. Right. But as you say, it's the ego coming up. Right. So we are not our first thoughts. They're mostly the conditioned thoughts. And so these are the ones that get us into the most trouble, but they're the ones if we're not vigilant around them that we act on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that that's the scary thing in the the world now, because we're, you know, we're, we're, absolutely controlled by this. I, I would say, <laughs> you know, relatively mindful, but still I can get lost down hours of rabbit holes and things on that. And I'm like, man, yes. where did that go? It's crazy. Um, just, just quickly, Annalie, your, your background, when, when we were emailing um, at the start of the year, all those years ago, the start of the year. Yes. Um, in the normal your, world. Yeah, exactly. Um, you mentioned that you have the background in some of this kind of Jungian gestalt stuff. D- did you have a background in psychology? Were you working as a psychologist previously? Or? No, I wasn't. But I can tell you, I I do so much professional and personal development, yeah. and I hang out with a lot of psychologists because they're all in the same spaces. Because I'm I'm focusing on human behaviour, and most people are shocked that I'm not a trained psychologist, mm. <laughs> which I take as a compliment. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, no, so I invest anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars a year into professional development. That is how obsessed I am with understanding human behavior. What makes people tick? How do we connect? How do we influence? How do we communicate with one another? So I belong to several groups. So I've been going to a um, a process oriented psychology group, which is based on Jungian psychology Mm -hmm. for God, it must be 10 years or something now. So we meet a couple of times a year for four or five days at a time and we go hard. Woo, we go hard. I'm telling you right now, being a coach, um, being a facilitator, all of these disciplines require you to be a clear, clean vessel as much as possible. Cause you know, we're human. So of course mm. we're, we're loaded with stuff, but you know, you, you need to be as clear as possible as a vessel so that you can see the dynamics of what's going on in the group and with the people in front of you. And so that means you got to do your own work. And that, as you would probably know, is uncomfortable and inconvenient and exhausting. And 
so many times you go around the rabbit hole and think, have I not dealt with this already? Here it is again in a new layer. Oh my God, my friend, <laughs> leave me already. Yes. Um, so I've been doing those groups for, for many years. Also NLP stuff, also the Gestalt therapy, same thing again, working with groups coming back and really going deep into what's happening with systems particularly around psychology in the systems of how things move and work together, how we get the mainstream, how we get the marginalised, what happens if things go underground, what happens if they're now a ghost role in the system and how that does damage for the good of the mainstream. So all these things that we've been talking about today, I actually look at from a very strategic um, behavioural map, if you like. So I am, I feel like a bit of a puppeteer going, right, I'm working individually with a woman, I'm working individually with a man and then their teams and then their leaders and now I'm looking at the system going, there's a lot being invested here. I hear the murmurs of a disgruntled system. If we don't make space for this to get airtime, it's going to go underground. If Mm. it goes underground, it's lost and we're never going to get it and this is going to become stuck. Mm, absolutely and you can you can I, I, in, in the way you're talking that you can hear uh Jung talking about the societal or collective shadow and you know i would even yes, argue further, exactly. it's not, it wouldn't potentially what's what's stuffed underground is not necessarily just going to be lost forever it's going to have really bad consequences with um you know things like we were talking before with resentment and, and all these other movements yes. now that are uh re- really just time wasters which is, which is, and I'm, I'm, I mean that um, technically. I'm not having a go at anyone, but I'm just, yes, I'm just saying, yes. like, they're, they're pushed that way, and they're, they're, they're in, um, perpetuated by these incredibly painful, negative emotions that uh, that no one wants, because that'll lead to really bad kinds of consequences and things. So um, you can hear the Jungian. It's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah, well, for me, it's the only way to understand the human psyche, you know, both on an individual level, a group level and a systemic level. It's just, it's got so much to teach us and there are so many levels. (laughs) (laughs) I know, but we have to start with the conversation, don't we? We have to begin. Yes, 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 absolutely. And that's the aim of the book is to start a conversation. Already I've had one of my clients give it to her husband and say, it has already started many conversations that we hadn't touched mm. before. They're not always easy or comfortable, but they're really important. So I'm really glad that we're starting this conversation now. Mm. Oh, that's ideal. That's perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Annalie, where can people find you? Where, more importantly, where can people find the book? Is it out now? It is still on pre-order. It's available on pre-order. It will be out, it'll be out in November. So they can find me and the book at my website, which is, do we still say, www.annaleeblundell.com. So that's A-N-N-E-L-I and blundell.com. Beautiful. B-L-U-N-D-E-L-L. Correct. Yes. Love it. Cool. And we'll put that in the show notes as well so people can click the link and we'll take them there. Thank you so much. This has been a, uh, a long time coming for us, I think, um, and uh, it's so cool to finally chat. It's awesome. Yes, that's because it took me a long time to get the book out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so out It's now, a celebration so on all accounts. Yay. So <laughs> no, Thank awesome. you for your patience in waiting for me to finish so that we could have this conversation. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was definitely worth it. I really, I, I learned a lot and I really, um, I really appreciate those kinds of conversations because I think uh, they're, they're needed for, for our development and so we can learn things as well. So, Awesome. Yay. Thank you so Tom. Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate it. Loved it guys. Thank you so much for listening. Speak to you next week. Bye-bye.